All right, welcome everyone to Deprogrammed on Unsafe Space. I am Carter Laren, and I always forget to do this. I always forget to take off this freaking thing. So let me try that again. There we go. You can actually see me now. Uh, I'm Carter Laren. This is Deprogrammed on Unsafe Space, and I'm joined as always by the bad mamma Jamma. Carrie Smith. Carrie, say something brilliant. Oh, gosh, that's a lot of pressure. Hi, guys. <laughs> Nothing brilliant yet. That was great. I'm, I'm very excited about today's episode. Um, Deprogrammed is a weekly live show on Unsafe Space in which we unravel the social justice ideology. You can follow us on Twitter at Unsafe Space. You can go to YouTube and subscribe, please. Uh, we're Unsafe Space on YouTube. And you can go to our website at unsafespace.com. Um, today, we're very excited. Karen and I are both very excited because we have actress Julianne Davis on the show. Um, Julian has been an actress, model, singer, artist, writer, um, sometimes political op-ed journalist for Fox News and Heat Street Magazine. Uh, she's a dual USA and UK citizen, having traveled the world, having traveled worldwide and lived in various countries uh, of Europe for nearly two decades. And she brings an international perspective to politics and life. When she came out publicly as a conservative and a Trump supporter in 2016, um, in a Fox op-ed, she was insulted, uh, dissed publicly by pundits like Bill Maher, which is actually, I think, is a, a badge of honor, uh, shunned on social media and in real life, unfriended by many of her entertainment peers, and even received death threats. Um, despite all that, she continues to stand strong with her beliefs and is here today to talk to us to discuss some of those experiences and her thoughts moving forward. Um, you can follow her on Facebook, which is where she would prefer you go. She's just Julianne. J-U-L-I-E-N-N-E dot Davis um, on Facebook, or you can go to Twitter, Julian underscore Davis, or you can go to juliandavis.com. So with that, uh, Julianne, welcome to Deprogrammed on Unsafe Space. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Great to be here. Yay. Um, I'm so I excited to get to talk to you. I know we, we're going to repeat this because I just talked to you before we went live, <laughs> but um, we were That's trying to remember. Old hat now, isn't it? <laughs> it's all old hat. Yeah, I'm over it now. <laughs> I, I'm still um, going to complain about the video that you just uh, you inspired me to watch. If no one has seen that, Julianne talked. She was on. You were on Alex Jones. Yep. And you mentioned this Goddard Tunnel opening ceremony video in yes. from 2016 in Switzerland. Yes. It's like the creepiest, weirdest, satanic cult thing I've seen, and it was probably funded by taxpayer dollars. So. Uh, I'm not sure whether to thank you for pointing me to that, Julianne, but uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, you know, um, there's a lot of dark things in the world. And I think that we're in really intense times as well. And I don't want to get biblical about it, but honestly, there's a lot of dark things that are kind of coming to a head. And I think that um, one of the reasons I came out, see, look, uh, first of all, I've really been a conservative since about 2001, just after 9-11. Well, That's how do you what, define conservative, by the way? Because I think okay. a lot of people use that differently. Um, well, you know, it's been, a, it's been a slow run. I mean, my, my parents were initially very liberal, and then they became conservative when they were older. When I was very young, I tended to go with their conservative ways because, you know, when I was kind of like 18 or whatever, I was a bit more conservative. Um, but then as I got older and I moved to Europe, then I became much more liberal. And then 9-11 happened. And then I started um, reading about, because, you know, I, I couldn't help but ask, well, why would they do this? And so I started reading about Islam. And uh -huh. I read a lot about Islam. I know way more than is comfortable to know. And, um, and that's what started it. And then once I learned about that and I started questioning all my other beliefs, then it just, everything just kind of fell like dominoes. But I mean, if it was even a few years ago that I had, um, you know, I was on the fence about things like gun control and things like that. And, and um, so, you know, I mean, all of us are evolving and we should, we should always evolve and we should always question what is truth what is the best way forward for humanity and all those things. But um, uh, yeah, I think it's the people who don't evolve that, that kind of weird me out now. Yes. I think that that's normal or something. Yes. 
Because I went through my own moment of kind of waking up. I wouldn't say I'm conservative. You, I think you know this about me. I left what I call the SJW left. And that's kind of what we talk about a little bit on this show is waking up from that and becoming like, just like, no, hey, I'm a liberal, <laughs> not an SJW. Yeah. That right. has been a big enough change that people are kind of a lot of, I lost friends. People in my life were put off by it. Yeah. But don't you think that's weird? Like, isn't it normal for people to, I think we're more normal than they are. I, I totally agree with you. And I, I think that also, you know, maybe some of it comes with getting older too, is that you start thinking about what works in your life and what doesn't work in your life. And, you know, I was trying to think how I could sort of encapsulate the difference between um, leftist or leftism, as I call it, and people that are uh, more classical liberal or people that are more conservative or libertarian, because it's kind of like those two groups. And here's what I've discovered is that, you know, I've gone through some very hard times in my life. I've had depression, I've felt victimized, I have been victimized, um, like everybody has. You know, we've all had varying hard times. Doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, whatever, you, people go through trials and tribulations. The difference, I think, that you know, people on, on, I'll say our side tend to come to terms with is that they realize that the only person that is really going to be able to help them is them. Yep. And the difference is, is that we look inward and we think, how can we change our world by changing ourselves and being an example with ourselves and having the freedom to be able to do all the things that we can do with ourselves. Whereas people on the other side are thinking, I'm a victim, I'm oppressed, I feel like crap, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's the world's fault, it's the government's fault, it's the medical industry's fault, it's the college's fault, it's everyone else's fault, except for, you know, and that's not to say that people don't get genuinely victimized. I mean, you could be walking down the street and some guy's gonna shoot you or rape you or whatever, you know? Right. That does happen, but it's how you deal with it that makes the difference. So the people on the left, they externalize it and they go, okay, we need more role, more rules, more laws, more government in order to make things okay so that I'm not oppressed, so I'm not victimized, so I'm not all of these things. Whereas people on our side will say, okay, this happened to me, but how am I going to deal with it? And how are we collectively, and I'm not talking about collectivism, <laughs> I'm saying we collectively, thinking individually, can work together to create a better society. You're talking about cooperation, not- uh, Yes. Yeah. yeah. So- yeah. Um, You've nailed it, by the way. I think it's, it's fundamentally more about a psychological difference rather than an uh, intellectual disagreement. Um, no, it's an intellectual disagreement as well, because, you know, the psychological goes into the intellectual. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So, all right. So they intellectual. Here's the thing. The left intellectualize their emotion. Right. Yeah. So that, I guess that's what I mean. Like there's a lot of uh, we all we all do this. Right. There can often be a lot of rationalization for how you feel. Yeah. Um, that's just a, a thing humans often do. And, yeah. you know, you need to check yourself and make sure you're not doing that if you're trying to be a rational person. Um, you know, it's interesting it, that you bring up the word rationalization, though, because rationalization, think of, and this is why, Carrie, this is why I'm a conservative. Because when you rationalize something and you don't have any kind of uh, a moral base to draw from, and I'm, and I'm gonna bring up the whole, like a, you know, like a Christian foundation, or a Buddhist, or a Hindu, or whatever. You don't have that foundation that is immutable. You can rationalize anything. I yes. Mean, anything, you know? And the left, they, they eschew those foundations, and that's why their rationality is becoming insane, <laughs> in well, my but opinion. They seem to have some sort of sense of uh, of morality. It's just because because I'm evil because I'm a white guy. Like that's a moral position, <laughs> right? Um, you're a bad person because you're conservative. That's a moral position. Oh, and right? I'm white, you know. So. Yeah, um, 
So yeah, you've got you've got a couple strikes against you. It's a very oh. shallow kind of. You're right though. It's a very shallow kind of uh, sense of morality because it is just based on these identity groups. Yeah, that's it. And then, like you said, everything because it's also postmodernist, which I think is kind of like we've talked about. It's kind of like nihilism because if you believe yeah. in everything, that anything goes, then you believe in nothing. Like you said, right. there's no underlying values there. That's so, it. I Which agree. is why they worship their government leaders. So wait, so this is okay, awesome. I did that. not expect this conversation to go this way, but I, I have to speak up now. So I'm an atheist, very <laughs> okay. Christian. I, are you oh. Christian? I assume you're Christian. Um, you know, I'm. I, this is a tricky subject for me because um, I was a Christian many years ago, a, a, like a born again Christian. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not going to say I, you know, died again or anything. I, I, I haven't. Um, and I'm not going to say that Jesus wasn't divine in some way. I'm not going to say that. But the, the definition of Christian seems to be that I have a personal relationship with Jesus or God or whatever. And, and I, I, I can't hand on heart say that I have a personal relationship. You know, so it's not like I pray here? every day or whatever. But I, I absolutely believe that there is a God. Um, I absolutely believe that there is true good and true evil in this world. And, um, and I absolutely believe that the morality that comes from God, that comes from love, that comes from truth, um, is immutable. And that's the issue I have with, um, with atheism, because I don't know where you get your morality from. I mean, I, I can see like the social morality, but I think it still came from our Christian foundations. And that's not to say that you have to believe in the dogma. And I think that that's why a lot of atheists have issue because it's the dogma that they find difficult or, you know, and even for me, I don't like going to a church and having everybody go, praise Jesus, God's been working in my life today. I'm thinking you just do that because you see the next guy next to you doing that, you know? So have you ever, Julianne, have you ever been to, I'm a very new Christian, by the way. Oh, uh, no. no I, huh? It's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying, I'm a very new Christian, but um, I kind of started exploring things when I was still living in Los Angeles. I, I started going to, uh, what set me on my path, I guess, was I started going to Agape. Have you heard of Agape? You're in LA. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's that non-denominational, right. it's a bit more open. So that was my that's gateway. That's the Oprah that's thing? Cool. Yeah. It's Oprah's preacher, Michael Bernard Beckwith. Yeah. It's a good church. They do a lot of this though. That's why I was thinking about you. Yeah. I, I like, it was what I needed at the time. And then it kind of, I went down this path where I explored a lot of different um, types of churches and. Well, and you of, know what? I'm not going to, this is just talking about me personally. I'm not going to oh, yeah. be one of those that tends to just, I, I don't tend to go with the crowd. I just, I, I guess I'm a bit of a loner. That's the truth. And I think we're all, all three of us are probably loners in different ways. So that's yeah. cool. But you know what? I think it's good for society. And I think that church is good. And I think that kind of fellowship is good. So I'm not going to diss it on that respect. It's just that for me personally, I don't feel, um, it just didn't feel right for me to, you know, yeah. to continue on with that, you know, but that's, but that said, um, I love all my Christian followers and I have, great friends that are Christian. And I, you know, I kind of consider myself Christian. I will get behind the Christian faith all day long. Especially Carter does too. For an atheist, he gets behind the Christian faith well, a so lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I want to clear, there's, realize, there's a part where I can agree with you a little bit on yeah. the atheist, but we there's a part where the, the power and the strength in it, right? Well, so look, what happened philosophically is atheists came, this is how I view it kind of uh, in, in a metaphorically, right? Atheist philosophers came down and they, they ripped down the churches, which is like the, the foundation of a lot of society, right? They, they ripped down the moral structures. They ripped down the churches. They said, God is dead. Okay, fine. Like I actually agree because I'm an atheist. However, um, they, didn't, they didn't work on then rebuilding like, okay, well, how do you build morality out of uh, like, how do you then answer moral questions? And instead, they basically became nihilists, or I like to call them state theists. They basically replaced God with the government. And they're like, oh, well, um, whatever, whatever the government wants, especially if it's democratically elected, that's where morality comes from. And that's not where morality comes from. Yeah. Um, but there have been atheist philosophers who have 
tried to tackle this problem, like Ayn Rand tried to tackle the problem of objective morality. They're not all subjectivists, is my point. Ayn Rand, and actually, we, we talked before the show about Stefan Molyneux. I think UPB, his universal preferable behavior, I, I was able to teach that to my, my daughter from basically the day she was born. And it's very effective and it's objective. And it's at least a social morality. It doesn't tell her how to um, make personal decisions for her own life, but it does tell her how to treat other people. You can derive don't murder from UPB and those kind of things. So I, to me, I think the problem with atheists is um, most of them are Marxists and, and state theists and that it, and they're nihilists, but they don't have yeah, to be. I, mean, I just I, think I, it's a it failure actually, of philosophy. It, it, it actually makes me sad when I speak to atheists. I think that a lot of atheists, and, and I, you know, I don't know all your views, so. Um, no, that's okay. Um, but I'm just gonna you know, say what I say. Um, there's too much in the world. There's too much order in the world. There's too much beauty in the world um, for, not, for there not to have been um, not only an intelligent creator, but um, a loving, intelligent creator. And I could give you example after example after example, but I, you know, I don't feel that I need to. No, no, we don't have to have it. You, you know, and that's, and that's the beauty of this free country and the freedom that we still have and hopefully can hang on to. Um, well, and this is why I'm aligning thoughts. with Christians like yourself and Carrie, right? Because it seems like if I had to choose as an atheist, who, who, what kind of a society to live in, the Christians have done a pretty good job of giving us some freedoms and like having a relatively great society. I, I don't want to live in, I don't want to live in the atheist societies that have popped up so far. Uh, yeah. They've killed hundreds of millions. <laughs> like, you know, certainly don't want to live other, under Islam, which I do want to talk about because you're oh, I really want to talk talking about, about Islam. Um, so, you know, I think, and the Christians are, are one of the last, and actually conservatives are oddly one of the last defenders of free speech. Yeah, um, yeah which is just so bizarre to me because I, I grew up viewing like the ACLU as and the left as like the free speech proponents. Right. And right. that's not true anymore. And um, the ACLU has changed. Julian, I don't know if you saw this, but they, they, they leaked a memo or there was a leaked memo last year that they basically are talking about, they're using all the, the far, the leftist ideology now there's, and they're saying that, um, that freedom of speech is, is they're not going to support it if it conflicts with marginalized community. What, what basically they're saying our entire purpose has yeah. now been subverted to this SJW ideology. So right. here's the good news. And here's the good thing about what happened when Trump came in is that yes, we have polarized, right? But the great thing about that is that we now know people's true colors. Mm. Yeah. That's the thing I like about Trump is he's caused this polarization. And and um, I don't agree with him all politically, but certainly in the culture war, he has he has named the enemy and yeah. attacked them viciously. And yeah. no one was doing that prior to Trump. And to me, that's the most valuable thing about having him any, in any. It's position. very valuable. And and the thing is, let me also say the reason I, I finally did um, come forward um, and not just stay in the closet. Cause I've been in the closet for years, you know, I mean, some people knew that I had some conservative leanings ish, you know, but I kind of wasn't really forward about it. And then when I finally did that Fox article, and then a little bit before that I was writing for heat street, you know, my views were starting to come out, but Fox really kind of like when it, you know, made it explode. <laughs> um, and the reason I did it is because when I saw what was going on with Trump, um, and I saw that we maybe had a chance to claw things back. That's when I, I thought, okay, I have to, I have to fight for this yeah. because, you know, in Europe, because I, I lived in Europe for 20 years, I've traveled all over the world. I see what's happening over there. I've seen stuff with my own eyes and, um, I still have a lot of friends over there and I hear about what's going on there daily. And um, I, one of the reasons I left the UK, one of the big reasons I left the UK and my English husband came with me um, is because of Islam. And I could really? see what was happening. Yes, I'm not kidding you. So I'm what not. can you elaborate on that? Because I think yeah. a lot of people view, um, when people bring up Islam, they just assume like, oh, you're just like a, a racist, bigoted, 
I know. Longer. And well, first so of all, Islam is not a race, it's an ideology. So that yeah. knocks that right out of the park. Bigoted, no, I've got black friends, Asian friends. I, you know, I don't care what color you are, I don't. Um, but what is happening in England and Europe with this massive migration? It had been trickling in from about 92, 94. We started noticing more and more people that were from the Middle East kind of hanging out in Soho, more Pakistanis, you know, more Saudis and, you know, all those sorts of people just hanging out like in gangs in Soho. And I was thinking, huh, that's weird. It's very different, it's starting to get different, you know? And then 9-11 um, happened and I remember there was this thing on Question Time. Question Time is a, a like a, an hour long show with a panel and an audience and it's on every Thursday on BBC, BBC One, I think. And um, I think they had, um, oh man, can't remember who it was. He was like the consulate or whatever, the American consulate there on one of the panel. This is right after 9-11. And yep. most of the, of the audience were on the left um, and half the audience were Muslim. Half? And um, the guy was practically in tears um, the way they attacked him. And in essence, the, the whole of the program was like, America deserved it. You know, they deserve wow. to have it happen. It, it was it was terrible. So that started it. And then the, the, the then there was things going on all the time with the BBC, Channel 4, um, ITV and the news and the way that the bias was just unbelievable. And this is back then. OK, this is like, you know, after 9-11, this is not even anywhere near how bad it is now. It's so bad now. It just you wouldn't believe how much has changed. Um, but it was uh, 2005, it was right after the Danish cartoon incident. Um, and my husband and I decided to go, they had a protest, like the um, Islamists had a huge protest. And then they had this counter protest, which was pathetic. So we went to Sloan Street, which is where the Danish embassy was. And my husband and I showed up. And um, there was a guy there was, who was like, I don't know, 80, who you know, fought alongside the war with a, a Dane and, you know, thought he should go to show his support. He was there with his grandson. And then one other guy was like 31 holding a sign that said down with Islam. Meanwhile, on the other side of the street, you had 200 um, Islamists screaming and yelling with all kinds of signs saying, you know, death to the infidel, behead the infidel, uh, get ready for the new Holocaust, et cetera, et cetera. Right. You know, Islam will rule the UK, you know, all that crap. Right. And who got arrested? Yeah. The 31 year old with the sign that said, down with Islam. Wow. Right. He got arrested. So my husband turned to me and he said, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be here to see this country go down. I don't want to be here. Is that your prognosis? Is it over for the UK and most of Europe? Or do you think? You know, a um, I don't want to say that it's over. In fact, I've, I've been talking, I've got another friend from Norway and, um, He's been saying a lot of what's going on. There is a, a massive populist movement that is rising up. Um, and um, I have great hope for that movement. And we'll see what happens at the British, this next British election. The conservatives and, 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 the, Lib and the Labour Party, as far as I'm concerned, and a lot of my friends um, in Europe, they're over. It's, it's over for them in, in England, in, in the UK. Okay. Um, and so really it's going to be between UKIP and for Britain and, um, and the Brexit party, right. Nigel Farage. Right. Um, but you know, I, I, I have hopes, but it is a, it's a, a very, you know, if you look at the, the cold, hard numbers and the cold, hard facts of how Islam behaves on mass, it's not looking good. Um, yeah. I'm not gonna lie, it's not looking good. And um, you would have to get fairly extreme um, in order to retain Europe, and I include England in this, Europe for Europeans. Now, I'm gonna say that- by Europe for Europeans? Right, we'll see, and this is the tricky thing because I, I say that and people go, oh, you're a white supremacist. No, right. I'm not. Um, I think that every culture and every region or country should be able to retain their culture and region. 
I mean, I am perfectly happy with if, if Islam, if people who are followers of Islam want to practice Islam, then why don't they go to their countries and their regions that Islam is already, you know, their government and their law, et cetera, et cetera. Why not go there and practice there? Um, same thing for, you know, in, in Asia, China for the Chinese, Japan for the Japanese. And that's, and I'm, I'm not, you know, Africa for the Africans and Europe, and I'm not including America in this, okay? Right. But Europe for the Europeans. Now, I'm not saying that I'm against intermarriage in any way. I mean, if two people fall in love, fantastic. You know, I don't care who you are or where you're from. If you've fallen in love, you've fallen in love. That's it, you know? And it doesn't matter what color you are. Love is love in that respect, okay? Yep. Um, however, in the situation with Islam specifically, um, Islam is monotheist and Islam is supremacist and Islam is totalitarian. So it doesn't accept polytheism. It doesn't accept atheism. It doesn't accept liberalism. It doesn't accept Christianity. It doesn't accept Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism. It doesn't accept any of it. That's the problem. And, you know, people think I'm the bigot for saying it, but the truth is Islam en masse behaves a certain way. And it doesn't matter about your friends and neighbors who are lovely, nice people. It's not that. It's en masse, it behaves a, a certain way. And I think Bridget um, Gabriel said the, um, the majority, the, the peaceful majority is irrelevant. And that's true. It's irrelevant. And in the case of, of Europe, if you have a situation where you've got a migration that is so massive, and you have a birth rate that is four times as high as the European birth rate, all you have to do is the math. And if people are saying, yes, but it's Europe, how is that gonna change? You've got the European laws. Well, the European laws are gonna change when there are no Europeans or there are less than a majority of Europeans in Europe. The laws will change to Islamic law. I mean, have you would dictate that. Right. Are you familiar, Julianne, with, um... Uh, Camille Paglia, Paglia, am I saying it right? She's a feminist professor. You're saying it right. Yes, I am. And she's yeah. fabulous. She's brilliant. And yeah. she talks a lot. You're reminding me of a, a video I just watched of hers where she talks about the late, si the signs that you're in the late stage of, of a culture. Yes. Civilization. I totally and how, agree with that. Yeah. And she's like, it's, it's, you know, you've reached that point when the culture loses faith in itself and doesn't believe in itself. Right. And then around the edges starts to amass a culture that does believe in itself. <laughs> and that is very, uh, uh, yeah, we're living on the edge. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, but so, and like, whether that's the, I think she was saying like the Huns or, you know, if you look throughout history, so right now she's talking about, it's like the I ISIL. If you've got these, this cult, this culture, that's like, uh, that's kind of, uh, seeing that that what you know there's this hatred in, in of what western civilization within western civilization that's yeah. happening right now and carter and i have talked about this on some previous episodes i mean there are with the the fire at notre dame i saw professors in medieval studies sjw professors issuing these long open letters telling telling other medievalists other academics words they cannot use you can't use the word western don't use the word western civilization don't use the word christian um be and and that's a self-hatred there of our own culture and so anyway her point was that yes if you if you lose faith in yourself as a culture or civilization then there's going to be someone at the door who is ready to you know, isn't it ironic? The reason why so many people on the left hate who they are is, oh my God, you know, uh, the Europeans did just terrible things. They did slavery and, and they colonized and they, they oppressed all these people and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, uh, what is the Islamic migration doing? The Islamic well, migration the Islamic slave is trade oppressing was. people. They are colonizing. They are supremacist. <laughs> I mean, point. how is it any, you know, and maybe the people on the left are thinking, ah, oh, well, you know what? You deserve it. <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, but the way I feel, I feel very, very strongly that 
um, although I have no skin in the game, I don't have any children. It's a regret of mine now, but I bought into the whole feminist thing. Long story. Me too. Um, even though I have no skin in the game, I am very concerned for the future of the West. Um, and I think in order for the rest, the West to retain what it is, we need to cling to all of those things that built us. And right. we are not doing that. Right. And we are letting, um, you know, collectivism and, and rationality um, destroy. What do you mean by rationality? That sounds like- a they're weird. rationalizing, they, they're rationalizing morality. That, that's oh, oh yeah yeah rationalized morality so now rationalization um, you know it's okay like the lgbtq oh God, i hate that word but you know that movement um mm -hmm. the trans movement the gender neutral movement the um you know the white is evil islam is great you know everything else is great except for white christian conservative western you know um, they just rationalize all of the other things and they're think they they want to throw out all the things that that we were that built us it's odd because the, go on the europeans seem to be self-hating more than any other culture like if you go to like so my wife is chinese and she grew up in china and the chinese See, love have is no, love there you go right. the, the chinese have no problem being like no you either assimilate to Chinese culture or get the fuck out. <laughs> right. Um, and the Japanese are the same way. Like, right. this is our culture. Like, you can come here and assimilate, but if you don't, you're out, you're gone. This is right. our culture. And, 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 you know, and it's interesting because with other people in other religions, you know, there have been um, Hindus in England, for instance, you know, for a very long time, and they've assimilated just great. I've got a friend of mine who's half Indian and half Swiss and brought up in England, and he's super wonderful, you know, and he's totally English, you know, he says things like, ah, oh, lovely, jubbly, and, <laughs> you know, loves his PG tips tea and, you know, <laughs> his hop knobs. <laughs> and, um, you know, he's totally English, and he's, he's kind of taken on that whole thing. But, Islam won't allow its followers to do that. And, and yeah, and, that's I, not the goal. And, I, and, I, and I don't understand the guilt. We, we have to stop with the guilt, with the Western guilt, to stop. We just need to stop. We need to appreciate what we've done, appreciate what we've, what we've um, contributed to the world. And this is when I get really angry because I think, my God, you know, we've contributed with science and industry and art and music. And we have like, there's so much richness in our culture. It, yeah. it, it makes me so, I mean, I'm just so sad and so angry about it. Well, and even the values of wanna... equality. Yeah, I mean, the most basic freedom of speech, uh, the, the um, individualism, yeah. you know, individual liberty, everyone should be equal under the law. These are all like Carter points out, enlightenment values and- Or Western. <laughs> Western values, oh, well, I mean, we sort of take them for granted. It's just- yeah. Uh, or and and like you said, it's there's this focus on cultural sins to the exclusion of the ways in which the culture allowed for us to uh, end horrible practices, like yeah. like like the reason we like end slavery, like slavery is yeah. are because is because of the culture, and yeah. the reason women got the vote is because of the culture. And but people um, don't realize who who you know. I mean, the the Europeans got. It's the, the African peoples were selling their own people to the, um, to the Arabs. And it was the Europeans that came later and, you know, and got into that. And yeah, then I think the Muslim slave trade was three times as big, right? That what? Yeah. Sorry, I was, I didn't mean to interrupt. I think the Muslim slave trade was three times as big as the European slave trade or something like that. Right? Absolutely. Was, and and yeah. actually it's still going on. Yes. Yeah. You can buy slaves uh, in Libya, right? Hell yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, why do you have no Africans in Saudi? Because the African men were all castrated. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, anyway. It, it, well, can, know, I, can I draw a distinction, Carter? Because I have, this yeah. is where we might disagree. I just have a question. I don't know enough about Islam, Julian. And, um, Julianne, sorry. Um, I haven't studied it like you have. Uh, I kind of, from, from my limited perspective, 
I think part of the problem in talking about it, where well, there's two problems. One is that the leftist ideology, what I call SJW ideology, they've basically made it off limits, as you know. If you if yeah. you if you discuss Islam, you're an Islamophobe, and you you you're just not. So people are afraid to even talk about it. Well, and yeah, and in fact, in, in Europe now they've got laws against it. That's crazy. It's crazy. You should be able to criticize yeah. any the belief Islamic system. Islamic blasphemy law is in place in Europe now. That's insane. Oh, yes. Yes. Yep. That's insane. So uh, thank goodness we have the first amendment here, but for, for now, <laughs> um, however, so one problem is that you're not allowed to criticize it. But I think the other problem is that people do think of their friends who are peaceful Muslims. I have friends who are peaceful Muslims who are assimilated, who are, are you know, third generation Americans who aren't really, they're not Islamists. Um, That's fantastic. I just wish that they would go whole hog then and then just leave Islam altogether. I know why they don't but they why? should because they're why not they? they're not really practicing yeah they don't really practice i guess well so yeah. what do you think about the muslims who are trying to reform islam who get like uh majid nawaz who gets called he gets called an islamophobe and he's so, a muslim i i have um zero faith and zero trust in majid nawaz um, oh really or any reformer um i'm really hard line on that and the reason oh. why because okay 1400 years this has been going on, 1400 years. There have been many, many, many reformers over the centuries. It has never reformed. Do you it, think has, it has a reprieve, there's moments. I mean, look at you know Iran and Syria in the 60s and the women were wearing short skirts. Yep, yep. Right, Afghanistan. But sure, what's yeah. Iran now? in the 60s was great. Compared. Right, but what happened now? Islam yeah. always reverts to its purest form. And the so, reason it does is that the, in, in the Quran, the Quran is considered the actual word of Allah. Right. And because of that, it cannot be changed or it cannot be contextualized. And this is the thing that Majid tries to tell people by saying, oh, but you know, you're, you know, he's saying kill the infidel, but you're not, you're not putting into context. Um, here's the reason why I believe, this is just my opinion, and, and there are others that feel the same way, why I believe that Majid and, um, what is it, Im, Imam Tawadi um, are, you know, they're all calling for reform, why I will not trust them. Um, I think that what they're doing is just trying to pave, make the, 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 the paving of the road to um, an Islamic world more smooth. So for those in the West who are thinking, oh, okay, so there is a reasonable Islam. There is a reasonable way forward that we can kind of get to grips with this while they continue to come into the West and amass and populate at a rate that is four times that of the West. It's so that's the thing, matter. if the demographic war is lost at this point, I mean, unless something- Unless massive. they repatriate, that's true. That is very, very true. Yeah. Really and, and as long as we believe in democracy, um, which isn't really the same as the constitutional republic that the US is founded on, right? We're not founded on the idea that 51% of people can take the rights of 49% away. Right. But but if that's the if that's the kind of system that you're living in, which a lot of Europe is much more like that, they don't have a bill of rights. I don't know if people realize there is no First Amendment equivalent anywhere else in the world. Um, Fifty one percent of people can vote away the rights of the minority, and so demographics are everything basically mm -hmm. at that point. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's it's. So I I used to. Well, that's Hey, I just want to point out, so on this show, I, I do like to point out when we have disagreements with guests, because I don't think you have that a lot on a lot of shows. So actually, I do have, I have a little faith in Imam Tawadi. I'm going to use his name. I, I, look, I, you know, the things that he says and the things that um, Majid says, you listen to him, you think, yeah, that makes sense. But they're still Muslim. And if you read all of the Quran, if you read about Muhammad, who is considered. I need to read it. You, you have to read it. Read the Quran, read the Hadith, read about um, the life and deeds of Muhammad, read what he did, who he was as a person. You know, if he's considered the perfect man and they are all followers of Muhammad, who was the founder of Islam, what are we even talking about? 
That's why a really interesting point. People, why are these decent? If they're if they're decent, if they're really decent, why are they still Muslim? When you know, I mean, you 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 have to read everything in order to know. But the more you read, I'm telling you, it's it's not comfortable. It's really not. I I don't like knowing what I know. And I will also say that the masses of Muslims actually don't know the truths in their own ideology. But the problem is, is that um, many of them don't read for themselves. They just listen to what the imams say. So the thing that they think that they're following is actually not accurate. Hmm. So that's, that's, you know. So, so somebody I, in the I, chat I was... has a good question. I'm sorry. I, I, this is a good question, Carter. I'm going to cut you off okay. real quick. Somebody says, so Julian, so what's to say that, um, if the reformers the, that the reformers couldn't have that like there couldn't be what we call it like the new testament kind of version of islam because you know a lot of if you look at christianity you know there's stoning of women in, in the old testament there are things because that i just said all every word in the quran is supposed to be the actual word of allah and it is haram forbidden to change or contextualize that word well, but so the Bible, look, as an atheist, the Bible is also supposed to be the word of God. And I, I actually, I, I had a similar view of Islam that there couldn't be a reformation. And I'm not sure where I stand on that. But I, can I just contextualize things for just a second? The, the, you know, the Christian church, one of the things that enabled what we call Western culture today is the Christian church did go through a reformation. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that reformation led to the Enlightenment in which things like the divine right of kings were questioned and we started to have the emergence of individual rights and the founding right. of America. Um, so um, I was kind of in your camp very recently and saying, it doesn't look like Islam is about to have a reformation. So, uh, you know, I don't think that's, that can happen. I have had someone point out um, a, a philosopher, scholar, professor kind of say, well, look, you know, it's actually, he pointed to a couple cases where maybe there is a reformation possible in Islam, but, um, You've brought up a really fundamental point, and I, I feel like I need to say this as an atheist because I'm not a Jesus worshiper, right? Yeah. Jesus and Muhammad are two very different people. Um, right. Jesus, like, I may not agree with a lot of uh, of uh, the kind of philosophical underpinnings of of the Bible, but you know, he didn't go around killing people. He he fed the poor. He did a lot of kind-hearted things, and he was he wasn't a generally he wasn't a sex slave owner. He didn't right. kill those who don't believe in Islam. You know, right? But Muhammad did marry his cousin. <laughs> is it true when that Muhammad, Muhammad married? A, so this is one thing I have heard, and I, again, I don't know enough. But is it true that he married a six-year-old? Nine. Yes. Aisha was nine. He married, he married her when she was six, and he um, had sex with her when she was nine. Oh, that. Thank you. Yeah. Was her name Aisha? Is that what was her name? Yeah, Aisha. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is there's the um, the Islamic doctrine of abrogation, which I don't think a lot of Christians understand. So, Carrie, you were talking earlier that like um, more I, I'm going to paraphrase what you said, but more consistent philosophies are generally more um, attractive to people. So when a culture kind of falls apart, someone who's giving a consistent alternative that's kind of uh, at least has internal structure and Right. and uh, non-contradiction is, is kind of attractive. And in Christianity, you do have contradictions in the Bible that um, yeah. kind of require contextualization. They require people right. to say, well, it says this here, but that there. So we need to put the whole thing in context of where we right. are now. I mean, you know, Islam, Old Testament was eye for an eye, New Testament is turn the other cheek, yeah. Right, and people have to, to, to rectify that, which, which invites right. a conversation about how to be a Christian. Um, right. But we in Islam- We did and it's been successful. Right. And, and in Islam, there's this doctrine of abrogation where they solve that problem in a different way. They don't have to have the conversation because the doctrine of abrogation means the later verse is correct. Um, and the later, later verses, verse. and, if you look at, and if you look at Islam chronologically, it says everything about how it works because early on in Islam, um, in the early days, uh, Muhammad was peaceful. And it was only when he gained more uh, of, a, of a populace um, following him that he became more violent um, and revengeful. Um, and so that's very interesting when you look at how Islam has behaved through history because they do behave like that, which is why, and you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people that think, you know, when I talk about this on my Facebook, because it is a big subject for me, 
they say, yeah. why, you know, I don't, I don't see any sign of it. I mean, I don't see any sign of it here where I am in Los Angeles. I mean, you know, once in a while I might see a Muslim person, but not very often. Um, but it's, they are, of course, they are peaceful when they are a very small minority, but as the majority grows, so does the peacefulness go away. Um, mm -hmm. And so then you have more terror attacks and you have them infiltrating schools and uh, government and everything like that. And so now, you know, what do we have? What do we have right now? They've amassed in a certain area in, in America um, enough where we now have two congresswomen in our government that are Muslim. Right. And your argument is that the peaceful ones are just less devout. Yeah. The peaceful ones just ignore it, but they're not, they don't leave. And the reason they don't leave is because if they question it, they die. If they question it, that's blasphemy. They die. Uh, yeah. If they leave, they die. That's apostasy. And it, you know, if, if Islam is going to get anywhere, they would have to have a situation where, um, you know, all the leaders of the Islamic world would have to say, okay, we are getting rid of the blasphemy, the blasphemy and apostasy laws right. where we can question it. Now, if that happened, if that happened and people were allowed to leave and allowed to question, then Islam would die out. Yeah. Or, have, or they would have, have to have again. There's a lot of people in the world that really are basically good. I've, I've met Muslims that, you know, they're good people. They don't actually, either they're lying, which is possible, or they really are good people and they don't know the truths of their own um, ideology. Right. And it's not a religion. Really I'm going to say that again and again and again. It is not a religion. And this is the reason why they've gained so much um, in so many countries, because they fly under that religion banner, which people are like, oh, OK, well, you know, you should be able to practice whatever you practice. But it's a religion. It's a government. It's a law. It's a daily rule book for how to live your life. It's, it's totalitarian in every way. It's a culture. It's everything. So that's actually really, I want to underscore that point because I think a lot of Christians, because I grew up Christian also, and obviously I'm in a, a Judeo-Christian culture. Um, right. You know, a lot of Christians are like, they view a religion as, even if you're very devout, it doesn't necessarily, it's not like you want a theocracy. You're just very devout right. and you still recognize someone else's rights to not be devout. You might go try and proselytize to them. Right. But you don't shoot them or take over their right. and, I, and I think and I whatever. think that's the mistake of a lot of other religions to say, well, you know, if we kind of gang up on Islam and say you're not allowed to practice your religion, um, then that means that you know we could lay the road open for us not being able to practice ours. But right. what other religion in the world, right now in the world as we have it? is unaccepting of polytheism. Every right. other religion is accepting of polytheism. There's right. only one that is not. Right, it's packaged with an ideology, a political ideology that is authoritarian. Right, and you cannot separate them. That's right. very important. You cannot yes. separate out the religious aspect and the political and legal and governmental aspect. And the, it's like, it's all encompassing. And, and this is what people aren't recognizing. And look, I, you know, I hate knowing this, actually. I, I really do. I, I wish that the world was like it was 20 odd years ago when I was, you know, fluttering around Europe, having a great old time as a model and singing and having with my band and, you know, in various acting roles. And, you know, I mean, I had a great old time going to clubs. My husband's a DJ, hence the records. Um, <laughs> And I, I really, you know, I miss that time. I miss that time of, of um, you know, not knowing all of this. But we, we, you know, the message, and I know we don't have much time. The message I really want to say to a lot of people, if, if anybody's watching, is, you know, don't look at me like I'm this racist, bigot, um, Islamophobe. No, what I would like to do is retain our freedoms. Whatever you want to think, whatever you want to believe, whatever lifestyle you want to have, have it. But if you continue to do nothing out of fear, out of saying something about Islam, you, your children, your grandchildren might not have it in the future if we allow that to continue. That's why I'm so hard line about it. I don't want to see all of our freedoms go away. Yeah, and, and, and it's a real threat when we, and we take them for granted. And it's, it's important, I think, to realize that 
throughout history, we've been collectivist tribal tribes, basically. And the idea that they're, they're for a brief period so far in history, there exists um, some geographical location where it's not primarily about tribalism and you can coexist with people with different beliefs from well, other and this is really, tribes. Yeah, this is the beauty of America, I think. That's because, what I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's why I, when I talk about, you know, Europe for Europeans, Africa for Africans, I don't include America in that. America is this new beautiful experiment where we have been able to assimilate up until maybe the last 30 years. <laughs> I mean, I don't think we have been assimilating well in the last 30 years, actually. No. Well, it's easier to assimilate when there's no safety net. So when you, you, you know, in the, in the, you know, a century ago when immigrants came here, I think something like a third of them ended up leaving and going yeah. back. There was no safety net. So you come here, you either assimilate and make it in culture or things don't go well and you go home. And that's not the case anymore. Now you come here and you don't necessarily need to assimilate right away. You've well, also I'm, have the internet yeah. where you can keep in touch with well, your old culture. And it's, and, it's a, the, and you know, and oh. here's the thing, this goes back down to, you know, like our side, their side, you know, being more conservative and being a, a, a lover of freedom versus um, having other people, government programs, everything take care of you is that freedom comes at a cost, but then so does the other thing you know, leftism and big government and government having more control over your life and, you know, free health care and free college, all of that, those both sides come at a cost. Freedom comes at a cost because you're on your own. Yep. And the other side comes at a cost because you're controlled. Well, so, I want to point something out. The freedom like, is your own cost. Too. Yeah. The, but the freedom comes at your own cost. The free... Right stuff comes at everyone else's cost and your cost. That's, that's cost. true. That's true. So and so you're subjected to, you know, let's face it, tyranny. Because how do you force, how, you know, the only way to make that work, you know, big government and all of those things, in order to make all of those things work, you have to force it. You can't course. get egalitarianism without forcing it because humans don't work that way. And, you know, with freedom, there's a cost and freedom, you know, it, it is risky. It can be dangerous because there are always going to be people that are going to be a little bit do lally, you know? Yeah. But that other side, do you want that other side? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I got to go. I got to go in about oh, five minutes. Cool. I have okay. to sit down. I could talk oh. like this all day long. <laughs> No, I'm so happy that, great. yeah, I'm so happy that you got to come on and uh, that you, you spent this time with us and, uh, um, I guess, well, I had some stuff I wanted to ask you about Hollywood, but I know you have to run. So maybe you can come back on another time. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love this to. Was, I'm, you know, was, I'm just going to say quickly, Hollywood is, is just a microcosm of the world. You know, there's plenty of other areas where you have, you know, a microcosm of people on the left and then a little, the, the little uh, uh, minority of people like us on the fringes <laughs> that believe in our culture. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, like I do want next time, maybe we'll ask you about Hollywood because it does seem that there's something uniquely left about Hollywood that's not the same as like the steel industry or whatever. Maybe I'm wrong, but- The uh, steel industry. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> something random, right? Uh, yeah, you know. I mean, they do say that people that are artists, um, artistically minded people tend to be more on the left, but I mean, you know, I'm an artist. So, and I'm a really creative person person the way my brain thinks is very creative so that that's it doesn't hold true all the time but yeah. um yeah hollywood hollywood can be a very dark place um getting back to the gothard tunnel thing i mean i, you know, I have this <laughs> friend who's a writer and we were talking about the dark crap that goes on in hollywood and he said to me this and it was kind of scary the way he said it he said he said you know he said as dark as you think it is it's a thousand times darker. Wow. Yeah, that's scary. And, you know, and, and I guess for me, um, I don't want to live in that kind of dark world. So, yeah. you know, I made my decisions and yeah, I haven't been working. And I'm bummed about that because, you know, I'm a good actor and I'd like to do more. Um, but, you know, at what cost? 
and I don't want to continue with the way things have polarized now. Hollywood has polarized, they've, they've moved so much further in that direction. Um, I, I, I just, I don't want to support those things. I mean, have you seen the kind of stuff that's on Netflix? Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's just so, uh, it's, there's so much of it that's so damn evil and dark. I'm twisted and and i just think i don't even want to watch that crap anymore do you are you familiar with uh sweeney todd you you know the song where he sings uh there's a hole in the world like a great black pit and the vermin of the world inhabit it and its morals aren't worth what a pig could could spit and it goes by the name of london i always i always think of that hollywood it goes by the name of yeah. hollywood <laughs> <laughs> like that's my revised version of sweeney todd <laughs> Um, yep. but, um, hey, I want to say something cause I know I have to go. And I said this at the beginning, but I think for anyone watching, obviously they're going to be who will disagree with you. I disagree with you on some things. I just think you're a, one of the bravest people that I've met. And I, oh. I think you don't have to, like we talked about with Megan Murphy, we had Megan Murphy on an episode. You don't have to agree with everything that a person says to recognize that they're, um, fearless in the face of consequences and in their pursuit of truth. And that they're and and it's obvious you're pursuing truth, and and that you're 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 not just walking in lockstep, and and you're not dictated by fear. You're a person who's let go of that fear, and I just I really admire that. So thank you, yeah. thank you. So. I you know I just I really I just want the world to be a better place, and I don't feel like we're going in a good direction, and that's why I fight for it. That's why I I fight for it. Really, I mean, it's just I'm not doing it. I mean, I'm not doing it to be more famous or anything like that. I've, I've learned a lot about the trappings of fame and it can be kind of a dark place. We can talk about this another time. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just think that what's going on in the world is, is um, it's a very intense time. We're at a very uh, grave turning point. And, and I, I do think that more of us need to speak up. More of us need to be fearless. More of us need to support the foundations of what our society was built on because even though we have a lot of problems in our society it's it's been a great and beautiful one too and and i i want to see it continue you know and there's a lot to fight Let's for cross, you know i mean let people think and believe different things and we can all find ways to live together under um, you know, a certain level of goodness and morality that kind of holds things together. Let's not let it escalate so that we're killing each other in the streets. Yeah. You know? Yes. Yeah. That's a great way to end. That's a great way to end the show. Um, so thank you again for coming on. Really appreciate it. It was a fun discussion. I feel like we could talk for hours more about it. I know. Things. I know. And I apologize if I've spoken over every, anybody. No, uh, no, no. I, no. The, the fault of my you family is those who spoke longest, loudest won. <laughs> so it's a very <laughs> bad habit of mine. I do um, it too. So it's okay. Yeah. I'll do it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's been super great. Yeah. It's been Bye, a lot Julian. of fun. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. So thank you everyone for, for watching and joining. Um, please go ahead and follow us at Unsafe Space on Twitter. You can subscribe, please subscribe to this channel. It's Unsafe Space on YouTube. You can go to unsafespace.com and uh, give us your email. So after we get banned from Twitter and YouTube, we'll be able to tell you where we went uh, because I'm sure that will happen. So thanks again, everyone. We will see you uh, next week. And also you can join Carrie and I every day on Unsafe Space in the mornings, kind of the mornings. Uh, we have a show called Daily Kofefi. So uh, join us for that. Take care.